All right, welcome to the Economist Board, where we discuss current economic environment as it relates to industrial production. I'm John Nelson with Morris Nelson and Associates. I'm joined by Keith Brather of Armada. And that we're going to look at a number of different industrial models that incorporate data going back uh, 20 years, looking at 18 to 20 different economic indices and hundreds of thousands of numbers and variables that we're going to try to crunch and make sense. In this video, and then the, all these seven, or actually now five related subsectors, uh, we're going to dig into what's driving each of our forecasting models and relate it to what we're seeing in the real world. So, Keith, are you ready to get going? Let's do this. Let's take okay. a look. Thanks. I'm going to go ahead and start sharing the models. There's always a little bit of a drum roll, you know, between months to figure out yeah. whether it moved or not. So, yeah, absolutely. So, drum roll. And the next slide is industrial production for manufacturing. And as you can see, with this, it's just a little bit of a softening of the dip, but it, but not a whole lot. Uh, the, again, you still have the same general shape. Everything pretty much looks the same, Keith, from, from the summer into the early fall. But the, about the only difference you can say is maybe two points different at the bottom of the dip, but otherwise not a lot of change in what, what the numbers are telling us. Yeah, it's fantastic. I mean, we've never had this kind of a, a model before where we didn't have a lot of significant change on the outer end. I mean, the, I don't know if it's part of solely the, the model stabilizing or if it is an economic uh, factor. Uh, so just explain that for a second. So part of what we have seen in some of the economic data is that between August and September, you get a little bit of a lull where um, you know markets are just cranking out products. We saw the supply chain improve a little bit. Uh, but when I look at other manufacturing data, we kind of got a little bit of the same story where it was just very consistent month over month. And so there wasn't a lot for the models to latch on to to show any major significant changes. So this is actually one of those better moments, I, I think, where we see less volatility in the forward look, which is great. And even uh, as you said, John, I mean, a little bit of the dip has softened a little bit. So it's almost a you know, if you look at it long term, it almost feels like a little more of a flattening out than it does a, a, a dramatic downturn. Now, that's not to diminish the fact that, you know, 100 is our base index uh, going back to what, 2017, I think. And so we are still contracting and this is a contraction coming in for next year, coincides pretty closely with what you see for uh, recession indicators from the Federal Reserve, uh, kind of looking at Q4 and Q1 of next year, and then a little bit of acceleration in Q2, but then picking up in the second half of the year. And our models right now, um, using completely different variables, is kind of showing us the same thing. So, mm -hmm. uh, and we'll, as we talk through some of these other sectors in this very first video, we'll we'll dive into some of those other underlying currents that are that are kind of moving the the models. And I'll point out before we move from this slide to the very next one, uh, if you can kind of focus on what does that, what does 100 mean or what does the dip mean? Well, if you look at where the dip is sitting here in, in uh, March and April of 2023, that's the same level that we were seeing back in March of 2021. So uh, it's about the same level. And if you, when we take a look at the, the long range chart, you can kind of see it a little bit more clearly. This is about when we were starting to really climb out of it. It's as deep as it was as we were climbing out of it. And then if you were to take a look at February and uh, January of 2020, you can see we were still significantly higher, up around that 99, 98 point where we'll be about three points lower. Again, remember scale. It shows a lot more volatility because we really kind of crunched the scale here. Uh, and so the difference between 95 and 100 really gets exaggerated. Yeah, it almost it almost really performs like a softer landing, right? Mm -hmm. So we've talked about sharp economic recessions, uh, deep ones, um, like what we would have seen in 2020. And you also got a little bit of that in the Great Recession. And so this downturn is still, I mean, it's still going to be felt, but you're right. I mean, if we were to change the scale here, you would see a dramatic difference. It would feel more like a softer landing and, um, you know, a soft, a soft contraction than it would more of a harder recession for the manufacturing sector specifically. Mm -hmm. And then if we take year over year, 
uh, again, pointing out just so you can make a little bit of sense of what might look like spaghetti initially is the dashed kind of burgundy line, if you will, is the forecast moving out. So beginning up here where we currently are, you should be able to see my mouse on the screen. Where we currently are, here's that dip that we're talking about. And it repeats that same dip back here because we repeat October through December for purposes of the chart so you can see where it's coming. And then, uh, and then you can see that softer landing and then starting to pick back up into about that 98 range on the back end of it in December of 2023. Yeah. So I have, yeah, don't have a lot more to add to that one. Um, I appreciate you describing the chart. <laughs> sure. Because your eyes so, always want to, because your eyes always want to come off this current year at like 96. And you want to see it kind of pick up in 2023 at 96. And and we we decided a long time ago, uh, a lot of the CFOs that follow our information want to see that overlapping quarter so mm -hmm. that they can see the trend coming into the current year and then uh, kind of pick up the trend uh, going into next year. So, so uh, as we take a look at overall industrial production, we also take a look at a couple of the big feeders to it is uh, both primary metals and fabricated metals. So we want to take a look at the resource side. But let's take a look first at primary metals. And uh, as you indicated for IP man, IP man looked very similar, except the dip wasn't quite as severe. And we're seeing the same story here with primary metals. If you take a look at where the, the dip ends up, the, the, the farthest down it goes is at about 76, where last month we were saying down at about 75. So not much of a softening, but still a bit of a softening of the overall outlook. Uh, the tail end is roughly about where we're saying, but if you take a look at the slope up front, pretty much the same type of story, gradual decline out through um, midsummer of next year. Yeah, so so let, I'll jump outside the models for just a second. So sure. some of what we're watching on a global basis is we're seeing a really weird dynamic that we really have not have not seen in other economic cycles like this. So what we're seeing is inventories on a global basis for a lot of raw materials still diving, right? They're still going down. And um, a lot of reasons for that. I won't get into it right here, but a lot of supply chain challenges um, or some production issues in some countries some geopolitical issues, as we all know, but all of those keeping inventories a little bit lower than they should be. But at the same be 12 to 13 different countries right now with manufacturing sectors in contraction. And because they're in contraction, those countries are not building raw material and raw resources as fast as they were earlier in the year. And so those materials are available for like the U.S. manufacturing sector. And so we started to see our improvement in overall output because manufacturers here are getting their supply chains in cycle. They do have inventories to go pull from. And so they're clearing their backlogs. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, some of the manufacturing data is up and it's improved. Um, but we still have what our models are showing, which is this back half decline because demand is still weakening and still softening. Mm -hmm. um, so, so primary metals, you know, part of what we are seeing here then is just the global market trying to adjust and trying to trying to wrestle with the fact that um, prices are coming down a little bit. They're starting to ease off, but um, inventories are still really low, and it's still keeping some of that supply chain pressure on in other parts of the globe where we're trying to get raw materials and parts out of. So. Anyway, it's interesting. I, again, right now, I think the U.S. supply chain will improve a little bit and start to recover. But then at the same time, the minute China opens back up and we start to see southern China really start to get their production underway. And when we see a little bit of drought relief in uh, you know, kind of the European sector and a little bit of energy relief, we get that. Um, you'll start to see the European sector start to take off a little bit. And those two, those two elements combined going to create a little more pressure on the primary metal sector, but um, it, it's a very, very complex, very difficult market right now to try and predict and try to figure out where it's going. And that's why, I mean, it's, it's you know, we look at the models and we trust them right now to figure out where, you know, where, where our heads should be at least, you know. Sure, sure. All right. Well, I don't know that uh, we Taking a deep dive here, looking at the, the long-term 20-year trend is going to tell us a whole lot of news. Uh, but other than I want 
I just kind of want to say that it is below the overall 20 year trend. You'll see it even all the way out through September of next year. Um, but I think what we ought to do is jump over to fabricated metal, Keith. Yeah. And I'm going to go ahead and take a look right here. And again, you're looking at something that looks very similar to Matt last, uh, last month, with the exception that fabricated metal looks much softer. It's, it's actually, that where it ends up is still pretty close. Where it was ending up, you know, way out there in the uh, March of 2024 timeframe, around 90, it's only ending up at about, uh, you know, 94 now. But that that dip is so much more softened. Um, it's still got a dip, but it's a lot more softened uh, by at least five points. So I, that's good news. Yeah, absolutely. And we've talked about the fact that, you know, the fabricated metal sector really relies on all those other models. And um, so if you're a subscriber and you tune in and you, you get the other models, you'll see things like aerospace. You'll see improvements in aerospace and some of the other models that really pull heavily and draw from the fabricated metal sector. So um, the models also pick up the fact that some of the raw material prices are coming down. And there are times when we've seen these cycles with raw material prices coming down that fabricated metal producers will actually start to stockpile some material. And, um, and, and so they've got items, and so, so they're showing output, but they're actually building surplus inventories. And so, so the industry is kind of benefiting a little bit from that particular trend, but I think that's also why it's lifting kind of the tail end of what, you know, what we're showing last month, between last month and this month, um, why it's lifting that rear end and lifting the, lifting, the, lifting the tail up a little bit on it. Still contraction, as you probably see in the next, in the next slide, but, um, you know, as you said, John, not as pronounced. Yeah, and the one thing I'll mention is, um, you know, you, you will see, we've talked this month about it, well, the bottom end being a little bit softer or in the month before, but uh, I think one key thing to, to note is that we're telling the same story over and over again. We're just kind of nibbling around at the edges on some of these first three models, which should give you some faith in the fact that, okay, it's going the direction where we go, uh, where we're talking about. This is clearly what what the economy is doing in terms of IP man, in terms of uh, fabricated metal and um, primary metal, you know, at different points, maybe not as severe, but it, it, the direction's clear. Yeah, and I met, I met with a major class one railroad this morning um, and they were working on strategic planning for next year and trying to figure out where the market is going. And one thing that's interesting is that they are starting to see some deceleration in um, some of their manufacturing sector starting to see and just hearing from customers kind of saying, you know, some of the demand is softening a bit faster than they had expected, which is odd. Mm -hmm. um, because again, like when we looked at when I talked about primary metal inventories and you think about raw material inventories being down or being they're low, like if you look at the global LME warehouse levels for aluminum, you know, they're sitting at 20 and 30 year lows. And yet the price for global aluminum is still coming down. And everybody, whether you're in transportation or manufacturing, we're all wrestling with what exactly is happening. And when you put everything together, you realize that the problem right now is on the demand side. And um, as the supply chain is catching up and as the supply chain is repairing itself from two years of really being out of whack, we're, we're, we're seeing improvements on that side of the equation. But now the demand side is kind of slipping and falling fast enough that it's it's causing the models to still look out there and say, hey, I you know I see recession risk. So yeah, what do you think in terms of could some of this be response to the Fed's the Fed's increase in interest rates? You know that means people can't spend the money uh, as readily on some of those larger capital purchases. So that would drive demand down, at least in my naive thinking. Yeah, no, you're right. Um, and, and the areas that's going to impact the most are going to be housing, number one. Housing hits, mm -hmm. gets hit right away, as we've already seen that. Sure. So fabricated metal, there's going to be some fabricated metal products that would go into home construction or, or various types of construction. So that gets hit first. Not all of the sectors will feel it as, as, as hard. Um, corporations tend to look less at the actual interest rates on products when they go capitalize them and go spend. Uh, then we see on the consumer side, the consumer, you know, is really violently uh, allergic to interest rate increases. And so we'll see that drop off first and more so in the housing market, less so in like automotive or machinery. 
um, some of those other components that, that, that U.S. consumers would be getting into. You know, in the farming sector, for instance, we see uh, private farm, you know, what we call consumer spending on, you know, new farm equipment. And so that shows up in some of our machinery data. And so you do see a little bit of pullback there as the, as the family farm faces a little more pressure than normal. Uh, but you, you know, generally, generally we were going to feel it in housing. So any of these sectors that touch housing, that's where it's going to really come across. Uh, the bigger, the bigger challenge is just inflationary pressures across the board, really constraining the consumer that causes fear at a corporate level. And so then you start to get corporations that start to pull back from spending. And that's why the models are starting to show us this weakness mm -hmm. uh, as we look out 18 months. Got it. Okay, yeah. well, that pretty much concludes our look at IT man as well. It's the, the, the big feeder sectors, if you will, fabricated metals and primary metals. Uh, Keith, any closing comments? Or are we there? No, I mean, I, I still I still think a lot of uh, corporations that I talk to are a little bit frustrated because they can't put their finger on recession and when that recession is. Um, I, the CEO told me, asked me today, hey, when's the recession going to be once and for all, period? Mm -hmm. And you know, we've already had two consecutive quarters right up front in this year of, of negative GDP, which most people think by definition that should be an you know, indicator of recession. But the National Bureau of Economic Research will actually signify real recession, and there's about 25 different metrics that go into that. All that being said, what we're seeing right now is most forecasts have Q4 being the beginning of the recession and it extending maybe through Q2 of next year, but that most data shows it being shallow and soft, which corresponds to what all the models are showing, and that companies will realize that there's going to be pockets of the economy that don't even know a recession is happening, pockets of construction, automotive, aerospace, some of those sectors that we cover in the ACES um, have optimistic forecasts, and there's a lot of reasons for that. So, so there's headwinds, and the Federal Reserve and interest rates and those kinds of things are those headwinds, but a lot of sectors are just going to blow right through it. So mm -hmm. the aerodynamics right. are good enough, they're going to cut right through that wind. <laughs> there you go. So, All right. Well, Thank you very much, and we hope you join us then to take a look at our individual success, uh, individual sectors. If you're a <laughs> it's subscriber, easy for you to say. <laughs> uh, yeah, real easy for me to say. All right, All right. take care. Thanks, John. Thanks.